Hello and welcome to this virtual Q&A here with District Apostle Kolb. Over recent years, whenever there's been a young adult conference or uh, what used to be a pillar conference, there would be usually an element of those weekends at some point where those attending would have an opportunity to ask questions. It was just an open Q&A time and we haven't had that opportunity uh, last year or in recent years and we wanted to create just a, a virtual uh, Q&A session with the District Apostle and provide an opportunity for young adults to submit questions, questions about faith, about the Bible, about uh, the church, about whatever uh, they are experiencing on their journey. And we collected those questions over the recent weeks through our Instagram, through our Facebook, through email and everything. And we've kind of compiled them into the top 10 or 11 so questions that we've been able to articulate. And now we're going to ask those to Distro Master Kolb. So thank you for joining us. And thank you for your time and your willingness to answer questions and help inspire some curiosity in people. So, uh, yeah, should we dive right in? Yes, please, so go ahead. Right in. All right, for our first question. How can so many Christians have such strong opinions on things that the Bible is vague about? Specifically, this question talked about, you know, the, some of the earliest parts of the Bible, you know, creation and, and different things, and how can people have such strong opinions about that, other denominations or other Christian groups, um, when we, we just don't know some of those things. Yeah, that's exactly the point. I think it's it, we can't speak for why they feel the way they do. All we can do is speak about our understanding. Mm -hmm. And in our understanding, um, yes, the early days uh, of creation, the description of the creation two times in Genesis, and then even the history that follows that is uh, very sketchy. It, it's, it's, it's a very... Um, open, let's say, to a lot of interpretation. But uh, our understanding and our faith is that we take essential, what's essential for our salvation. Mm -hmm. And what's essential is that we believe God, the Almighty God, is the creator of all things. That he created man in his image, and he, uh, by man I mean all of humankind, uh, and he intended that, that we would be with him. And, uh, but we see the fall of sin, uh, separated us from him, and so basically his whole plan of salvation is to bring us back together with him. Mm -hmm. And that um, overarching narrative can really be seen through all of Scripture. You know, I heard one time, if, if you're looking, you can see Jesus on every page of Scripture because there's something about the story of, of reconciliation, there's something about a story of restoration, mm -hmm. which, is, which is the gospel. So no, I think that's important to highlight what you said about the things that are important for salvation. I think the chief apostle uses this word decisive. Yeah, right? and, and I think it's also important too that, you know, we don't want to get into an argument about uh, all the very, very specifics mm -hmm. uh, because it's so, we have to remember it's it's a book of Moses, which Moses came over 2,000 years later. Yeah. So it's all written in memory, a story passed along all the way through the ages. So. Uh, there's some elements of it that we, we look at, of course, and, and we can take a, a lot of information or even um, learn from them. Uh, for instance, uh, the question when God said to Adam, where are you? You know, the, to reflect on that when God says the same to us, you know, but to look at all the details and say, and, and to argue uh, it was exactly this or exactly that, it's, it's not known to us. Yeah. And it's foolish to argue it. And someday the Lord will reveal everything to us. So, yeah. A moment ago you said Moses came 2,000 years later. Later than what? Can you... The fall of mankind. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. And we don't know that either. We don't know if Adam and Eve were in the garden millions and millions of years before right. sin came into it. So. Right. It doesn't make sense to, uh, oftentimes when you read this story, it seems like, you know, the next week it yeah. happened, and, and we don't know any of that, so. Yeah. No, yeah, we don't know, and, and we also don't know what we don't know. Yeah. What we do know, God created us, God loves us, and he has a plan for restoring that relationship. Yes. And I think it's important to uh, reflect again on the first service of this month to say we stand in awe yeah. of the creation of God. Yeah. Our Father has created and made all of this for us. Yeah, the what shall we do? That's yeah. our response. Exactly. Okay. Good. No, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I think that's a good answer to that question. Okay. All right. Our next question, uh, how do we know if thoughts, ideas, and or realizations are coming from the Lord as opposed to being inspired by a, a natural source? 
Okay, we can just start with what Jesus said on one occasion. Uh, seek and you find. Knock and it's open to you. So I think the first thing is that we ask the Lord for his advice, for his counsel. We're interested in it. And then we look to where we will find it. Uh, we can find it by reading scripture. We can find it by listening and assimilating the word of God in divine service. We can find it uh, seeking counsel with our minister, with our youth leader, our rector, but also f those brothers and sisters and even those that we work with or around us if we perceive that they have wisdom. And, um, and then sometimes the Lord can give an answer in the most unusual place because, again, he is God and he can do as he will. But when we're seeking him and looking for it, I think that's the most important thing. And also then we have to let that, uh, what we've heard, work in us. Um, Apostle Paul says we should have the spirit of our mind renewed. And I think sometimes we forget our mind is an important gift of God to also be used in addition to our heart. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that maybe the spirit only inspires the heart, but he also inspires the mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he's given us to, to think through things logically and effectively. And, and reason, reason yeah. them out. That's a gift from God directly to reason things. You know? Yeah. The things that are going off of this question about you know being inspired by a natural source there's so many potential influences all around us you know as communications as channels continue to become faster and, and more abundant uh, i read a, a study that a new york times article from 2007 said how in 1970 around the 70s people were exposed to maybe 500 to 1600 pieces of information a day Commercials, advertisements, billboards, you know, articles in the newspaper, whatever, pieces of information. Mm -hmm. In the 1970s, it was a range of 500 to 1,600. And then this article in 2007, which was already a few years ago, mm -hmm. said that it uh, is upwards of 5,000 pieces of information a day. And that being 14 years ago, it's estimated to be now around 10,000 pieces of information a day, you know, compared to just, you know, 40, 50 years ago being as low as 500 pieces of information now being exposed to 10,000 pieces of information all around us, every piece of advertisement and everything, it could be very uh, easy if we don't have certain filters in place mm -hmm. to let those things influence, to let other ideas influence us. Not, not that they're not bad to see them, but even Scripture says to test certain things. Of course. You know, you know. Discerning. Yeah. So. And I think uh, we have to look at the example of Elijah. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're looking for an answer, the Lord may not answer in thunder or lightning or some really uh, unbelievable way, but like you talk with Elijah in a still small voice, one has to be attuned to the voice of God in their mind, in their heart, to see what is the answer to my question. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a good point, too, is to have questions. If we're just kind of perhaps waiting I'm not going to move until I feel the inspiration. Ask what maybe the motivation is. Ask what what are we being inspired to do? What what is the will of God? The overarching will of God of of loving others and knowing Him more. And mm -hmm. how do those things fit into that? I mean, specifically with um, you know ideas and thoughts that are supposed to be influencing decisions. Like you're saying, should should I go to this school or that school? Should I marry this person or that person? There, there may not be one answer to that. Mm -hmm. per perhaps mm -hmm. it's what helps glorify God the most how can I grow closer to him whether I go here or there whether I'm with this person or that person how can I serve him how can I serve him right and so. part of that is to be like the psalmist said be still mm -hmm. and know I am God so mm -hmm. one has to discipline themselves to take some time to just turn off the 10,000 pieces of information around and say mm -hmm. I want to hear what does God want me to do yeah and if we're trying to discern how do we know if a thought is from the Lord or not what does it say? What does that thought say about him and his will? Mm -hmm. That's probably the... We will, it's very interesting because uh, this coming Sunday, we have a service about the conscience. Mm -hmm. And every person has a conscience that shows them to some degree what is good and evil. And if we feed the conscience and let it evolve in the gospel of Christ and in God's word, we find that he, our conscience can help direct us always in the right path. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. Okay. Our next question comes from a, a brother in Virginia. What does the threefold amen represent at the end of service? <laughs> it has been part of our tradition 
I think we got it from the Catholic Apostolic Church. Um, I can't say specifically it ex exactly means this, but we see that in a sense that it completes what began in the invocation, uh, evidence of the, tri to the Trinity of God. Uh, we start the service in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That, that's the invocation. That's saying. the invocation. And as we come to the completion of the service, after the closing prayer, God again acts and gives his blessing through the word of benediction. And now the congregation reacts or responds to that by saying three times, Amen, that we acknowledge that God has given us his blessing and we embrace it. As Amen says, so be it. Mm -hmm. We want this now. Mm -hmm. Something wonderful, really. And I think we should, it's nice to call attention to it uh, that uh, most importantly, the benediction, the blessing part, and then we respond by saying, yes, we, that's for us. It's, it's beautiful. Okay. Yeah, it's not just uh, some closing words. Uh, something's happening there. God's yes. blessing people. It's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, God is acting through the service, of course. He's acting in the divine word and then in, in the uh, sacrament of communion. And he acts again in the blessing. And uh, we're acknowledging that okay. before we leave. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next question, uh, also from our brother in Virginia. How can we make disciples in times when people may be reluctant to come to service in person? I think some context around this question. Uh, this brother also mentioned how the chief apostles emphasized this in recent years about the purpose of the church, the goal of the church is to make disciples. You know, not, not necessarily members of the church, but how can we do that when uh, people can't come to church or maybe as especially in COVID times, people are starting to come back to church or there's different protocols, they may not be comfortable coming back to church. How, how are we expected to make disciples in that type of situation? Mm -hmm. the, to make disciples means that we have to expose people to the, the teachings and the, the behavior, the conduct, the way of Christ. And so the best way to do that is to live in that behavior, live in that way. Uh, what we could call a, a lifestyle of the kingdom, uh, that we want to live in the teachings of Jesus Christ. And I think it's very important to stress that sometimes we may rationalize that and we hear that in a service and say, well, it's not possible. Jesus Christ is perfect. I could never be perfect. That part is true. We can't be sinless like Jesus Christ was. But he did say, learn of me. He said, love one another as I have loved you. He prayed to his father, let them be one like we are one. So if we say we can't do that, then we counter what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. So it is possible for us to learn the love of Christ. It's possible for us to learn his compassion, his understanding, and so on. And if we can have that and, and grow in that lifestyle, that I think is the greatest testimony to people around. For example, when we are not prejudiced, when we do not discriminate, when we don't, when everyone else is, is t talking down about somebody or even in social media writing something negative about someone, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. And we stand on the other side and say, wait a minute, that's not proper, that's not correct. I, I, I can't do those things. It shows that we, we have a different path. Mm -hmm. And then one can be exposed to Christ and see, is that the path that I want to take? It seems that this person is more peaceful. It seems that this person, you know, doesn't get all riled up by everything going on around us. They seem they have a more steady, uh, decisive path in life. Mm -hmm. And then one can fo follow that and find that in Christ. And then they must decide themselves. And in the midst of it all, Jesus is working too, that he opens their heart to it, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, articulating that. We don't just have a different path, but he's he's our motivation for our reactions and for our actions and for how we spend our time and our money and our energy, you know, and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's really three parts to this make everyone a disciple. It's what we do. It's what Jesus does, of course. He's the one working behind the scenes to make it all happen. And what the person then decides. Mm -hmm. yeah. If they want to follow and also be those that want to show others yeah. Jesus Christ. And, and maybe eventually that conversation does come up where, yeah, I'm this way because I found and experienced Christ in my congregation here. And mm -hmm. that becomes the, the avenue of connecting it to a congregation, perhaps, or, or a church. But, yeah, the, the main goal isn't just to 
get more people. It's to no. demonstrate the love of God. People maybe hopefully see that we're different mm-hmm. for good for good reason. You know, often uh, bucking norms and social uh, expectations, perhaps, of what's happening in the world around us. But then something's different because of Jesus Christ. And it's not, uh, you know, I don't believe Jesus Christ wants us to start revolution. Mm-hmm. He just wants us to live in the way that he lived mm-hmm. and promote that amongst others, that they are drawn to him. In, in Already, as the chief apostle said to us a few years ago in Washington, as a prefiguration of the kingdom, mm-hmm. that we already feel the Lord is near us, that we feel his peace, we feel his forgiveness, we feel his love towards one another. And when we draw somebody into our congregation, whether it's large or small, that they feel, yeah, there's, there's some uniqueness here. Not because the people are better or, you know, they're exclusive in any way. No, there's just some feeling here. And it's not just about friendship or that we have a coffee together. It's something deeper than that mm. because they've aligned themselves into the will and into the gospel of Jesus. Yeah, it's a shared hope. Yeah, yeah, which is very, very uh, powerful. And because of that, they see the future a different way. Yeah. Sure, we live in the craziness of this world, particularly in the last years now. But they see the future differently, and they have hope in that future because their hope is rooted and anchored in Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so summarizing that, how can we make disciples if we can't come to church? Do what Christ tells us to do. Yeah. Love one another, love him, seek first the kingdom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So our next question uh, comes after the announcement of the letter that was read a couple weeks ago. What is the goal for the additional apostles that will be ordained for the USA? Well, the goal for the additional apostles is the same as the goal for all the apostles <laughs> in the world, and that is to uh, preach and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to mm-hmm. prepare his bride. Uh, but specifically, these four apostles uh, will be active in the districts where they've been assigned. And uh, the underlying concept of it is is that because they're smaller districts, uh, the congregations will be exposed to the apostles more often, and they'll be able to visit more often. And I think that's very important uh, in my understanding. We are the new apostolic church, and when we talk about apostles as a, fundament, uh, fun, a foundational element of the church, then you should be able to see an apostle more than once a year, that he should be able to uh, even have some reaction and, and uh, some connection with him. And uh, this will permit that, being that they have smaller working areas that they can visit more often. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Our next question, are there plans for women to serve as ordained ministers? It's an unusual question because I would answer the question, No. There are not plans. There is discussions that women can or cannot or should or should not be ministers in our church. Uh, that's been uh, opened up very much on the NAC today and also in the community. Uh, the chief apostle has uh, shown very clearly what our path is uh, for this uh, question, for this discussion. And uh, we come back to the Bible again, of course, and we see what does God say about it. What did Jesus Christ say about it? Uh, And what did the first apostles say about it? And then what will the apostles of today in our church say about it? And then uh, it will be looked at regionally, you know, if it's uh, agreed, uh, how it will happen. So, um, yeah, it's it's being discussed. Uh, I can just say there's no end point to that yet, but I do know that it will be determined one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And, And not in you know, 10 years from now, but it will be determined. Okay, great. And, and some of these articles that you mentioned, we can put some links to that in our description of this video to the other NAC Today articles or different community articles that have helped explain some of these uh, discussions that have happened at the district apostle level. So. And I have to say, it, it's I'm very happy that we're having these discussions because um, it's important that we decide that very clearly because uh, something you had mentioned to me, the chief apostle said some time ago, certainly the reason is not because we're running out of men and now we should ordain women. That would be offensive all the way around to women. It would be disrespectful of ministry. Uh, That certainly can't be the reason because then they would almost be like secondary level and that's not at all the idea. The idea is, 
can they be also the same as men in serving in ministry? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's good that the that the chief apostle has outlined those uh, questions that are used in that decision making process, so it doesn't become flippant. It doesn't become someone's opinion, you know, on any level. It's just like you said, what does the Bible say? What does you know God say about it? What does the church say about it? So. And an interesting thing is what we just talked about before. We're asking questions, yeah. <laughs> and now we're waiting for the Holy Spirit to show us the path. Yeah. So that we go on the path that the Lord wants us to take. Yeah. No, absolutely. It can't be a decision that's rushed even either. You know. So. No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Our next question here. What are some good ways to find motivation in the Bible? Where in the Bible should I look? Talking about being you know, <laughs> yes, biblically okay. based here. <laughs> In one sense, uh, I would say if one is looking for motivation, um, I mean, there's many verses in the Bible that offer motivation and, and strength and and solutions, let's say, to issues that we have in our life. Um, but particularly, uh, the words of Jesus Christ. He said, my words do not pass away. That means that his words are eternally relevant at all times. They're not only for 2,000 years ago, they're for us today, and they're living for us today. So I would start with reading the story and the words of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, and then uh, the letters of the apostles give further uh, elucidation to that. And then when you go back to the New, or the Old Testament, after you've read that, it gives you some nice viewpoint mm-hmm. of how things are made in God's plan. Uh, we see the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for the person that asked this question, I, I think, you know, what are some good ways to find motivation? I think it depends on the, the type of motivation you're looking mm-hmm. for. If you're looking for motivation to just endure, you're just tired, you know. There's verses of Jesus saying, come to me who are, you know, weary. Weary and, and heavy tired, laden, you know, yes. And I'll give you rest. And, I mean, there's specific verses that could help in specific situations. Sometimes he's speaking specifically to specific people, so we have to also look at certain contexts and whatnot. But also the entirety, as we already talked about, the scope of the biblical narrative of is a love story of God and his people. Mm-hmm. That That's motivating, that's comforting, that's uh, enriching, that's clarifying about our purpose, about his love for us. So I think... In a, it's good to look at specific verses, and it's good to look at the Bible as a whole to find motivation to just keep going or find strength because it's God is, is working. You know? Yes, I think, and especially, uh, I address especially young adults, it's sometimes, as you say, come come to the end or they really are down. Mm-hmm. You know, there doesn't seem to be anything opening up or working right and so on. And the psalms of uh, the psalms open a lot of those kind of feelings. The, whether it was David that wrote uh, some of them, and, and other psalmists that wrote uh, some of them, they, they really start down in the dumps, and they, they really show I'm really at the bottom here. And yet, you can see as they as they continue talking, as they continue expressing to God their feelings, God responds to them. And by the time the psalm is finished, the chapter is finished, they have a completely different perspective. And I think we all have gained a lot of motivation from what uh, David has written sometimes, too. when we, Because it's uh, written in a, in a place where we see he has natural feelings like we do. It's a very honest place. Yeah. 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 Good. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, continuing with like motivation and, and being strengthened, our next question. How can I continue to strengthen my faith whenever I become busy with other things that impact my future as a young adult. I, I think the context of this question is, you know, as, as someone is, you know, young adult age, there's, there's college, there's career, there's relationships, there's a lot of things in a very concentrated season of life, and how can we continue to strengthen faith when other things are competing for our attention, becoming busy, I guess. Yes. Well, busyness, of course, is... Uh you know, really overwhelming in the world everywhere. Now even children have more, are exposed to more things to be busy with. Mm -hmm. I said once to some retired, my aunt once when she retired, you know, well now you're not so busy. And she said, no, no, I got plenty of things to do. So there's, everybody is very busy. But interestingly enough, everybody still has the same amount of time. 
And sometimes when I've spoken with some, they have told me, well, I've read these, all these books. And then I wondered to myself, gee, when did they have time to read those books? <laughs> and then I recognized, well, when I was doing this, they were doing that. Yeah. And they just prioritized their life and said, these are important things for me to do. And that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important if one wants to one wants to follow Christ and strengthen their faith and their relationship with him, that we make time for that. Of course, one of the more essential times is that we make time for divine service on Sunday, mm -hmm. that we make time for a small group discussion, that we make time to read scripture, that we make time to pray, that we say, yeah, I'm busy, got a million things to do, but these things are fundamental to me, mm -hmm. and these I have to do. Yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had some midweek experience themes around spiritual disciplines that covered prayer and, and scripture and solitude and, and worship and whatnot. And there are disciplines. It, it takes it takes discipline to mm -hmm. to work on those, to grow on those. It takes intentionality. It takes time to to do that for sure. Well, a discipline is 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 like a a higher level of a habit. Mm -hmm. You know, you, and yeah. a discipline is also related to disciples. Mm -hmm. So disciples right. of Christ can discipline themselves. Uh, Self-discipline is the last fruit of the Spirit that's mentioned. And so that it's important that we develop that, mm -hmm. that ability. Yeah. And there's actually kind of two elements to this particular thing about being busy. That there's about making the time, prioritizing our relationship with the Lord and, and growing in our journey of faith. But also part of that is, it's not just creating another checkbox. Like, yeah, I need to pray. I'll pray. That'll be the top of my list. It used to be fifth. Now it's the top, so I'm prioritizing. Mm -hmm. You know, pray, and then I'll do school, and then I do my social time with my friends, and then I do uh, my work time at my job and everything. But also creating, you know, infusing God into all those things, that we don't have this duality that, well, there's my time of creating a spiritual development, and then there's everything else. You know, yes. there's my spiritual life, and then there's everything else. Like we're... Like we're Batman. You know, there's Batman and then there's Bruce Wayne. Like we have two different personas depending on if it's Sunday or not, you know. Uh, but how do I, how am I glorifying the Lord when I'm socially with my friends? Yes. How, how do I, you know, demonstrate peace and the fruit of the Spirit when I'm at work and things are just going awry? You know, like it, it's, it's not just about prioritizing higher on our list, but realizing that the list, God, God's the paper the list is written on. You know, he's, yeah. he's, he's everything about it. Yeah. You know. It's a lifestyle. Yeah. It's not exactly as you said. And sadly, there are Christians that have that. They're one way in the church or one way in the Christian kind of way. And then they have this whole other way. I, I think we've talked about it once before. You, you're in traffic and you get upset. Yeah. And now what are you going to do? Well, to get upset is not bad. I mean, of course we get upset. We're, right. we're, it's what, how you react to that getting upset yeah. uh, that the problem exists. Uh, if you stop and try to work it through yourself and recognize, well, maybe the person who made me upset that cut in front of me, maybe today they have to get to the hospital or they have something very important to do. And other days, maybe I'm that person that also does the same thing. Yeah. And so a Christian stops and says, well, wait a minute, let me try to look at that a little bit more rather than just reacting and doing something foolish right. you know, or saying something foolish. Right. And that's the strengthening element of our question. Like when, when your body's becoming stronger, you know, I used to be able to lift 10 pounds and now I can lift 15. Like there, there's a progression there. Yeah. And this example of like traffic, I used to get upset right away. And then two days later, be like, oh, I really, maybe I shouldn't have done that. You know, now I, I, I want to get quicker at, at uh, repenting for that. And then eventually... Realize it in the moment, you know, like that, that's the progression, that's the strengthening element of, of some of those reactions. The Lord is with us and we're with him, and, and, and we should have a feeling, what does, how does he want me to react? That, mm -hmm. that we have the emotion, that we have the anger is not the problem. Mm -hmm. It's what we do with it yeah. and how we manage it. That's yeah. the, the important thing. It goes back to self-discipline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think kind of bringing it back to the question about how can we continue to strengthen our faith when we're busy, we're, we're all busy. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. a matter of, of uh, infusing God into everything, continually striving and noticing those moments where we do fall short and, and continue to seek Him and His Word and in the services and having a supporting body of believers that also help us keep us accountable too for strengthening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Infusion is a good word. That yeah. the, the life of Christ is infused in our life and yeah. we live one life. And he gives us strength. Yeah. He gives us strength to do that. He, he wants us to become stronger. Right. You know, he's not off on the sidelines. Like, oh, let's see what, let's see what he does here. <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't know. 
Yeah. Okay, cool. Great. Uh, our next question is kind of seasonally uh, applicable coming up at the end of this month. What is the church's position on celebrating Halloween? <laughs> well, we addressed this already some years ago, and I think in a vision article and in a teaching. Um, the the church, okay, doesn't celebrate Halloween, of course, and I think for anyone to celebrate it, one should look a little deeper into see how is it rooted, where, where does it come from, and when you do that, you sort of find it really has not a, a really strong reason to celebrate it. It's just something that has happened. Uh, in America, we have all kinds of, uh, not the patriotic holidays, but other kinds of special days that are just evolved from something and everyone just has a good time and a party and uh, I think any time um, you should look at what the Apostle Paul said I can do it but is it helpful mm -hmm. I can do it but does it edify does it build me up and so it's not the question of um, you know should I do it or not it's what what is the value of doing it is, is mm -hmm. it is it worthwhile for me to celebrate something like that mm -hmm. And if people want to, it's, you know, they say it's a thing for children and they get candy and, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, you know. The, th the part of the problem of it, too, is it comes near to our celebration of the source where departed. And mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, in one sense, we are, you know, looking at things uh, uh, from the eternity world in mm -hmm. this celebration. And on the other sense, we want to have the feeling of helping all and, and join together with Christ that, he, he has the will to save all, and mm -hmm. uh, this, it seems that the two don't marry together very well. So Yeah. No, I think, I think that's a good point, and ultimately it comes down to you know, what's lawful, what's helpful. And self-responsibility. Each one themselves mm -hmm. has to determine that. Mm -hmm. how they, some may say, I, I can do something, and it just leaves me. It evaporates. I've, yeah. I just enjoyed the, the time together, the fun together. Okay, well, that's... Each one has to determine themselves what, if it, if it leaves remnants or if that's something you can just casually do and, and put aside. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you on that. All right. Next question. Does someone have to go through pre-marriage counseling when getting married in our church? Specifically, our church offers this Prepare and Enrich as a program, I think they're referring to. Exactly. Um, it's not a mandate of the church to do that, but we strongly encourage uh, a couple to do that because it um, opens their feelings and understandings to maybe questions that they haven't even thought about too much yet. And now uh, it's sort of put on the table to think about that and, and to discuss that together with a, a moderator. Uh, we have couples uh, throughout the whole country that have been uh, trained to do this kind of discussions. And uh, I think it's, it's very valuable. Uh, I've never heard a negative comment from it. Everyone has always enjoyed and appreciated it. And, they, and many couples have told me they come back to it, to those discussions later on in their, in their marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think from what I know of the program, it, it helps also create um, or provide tools, not just so that you can get married you know, and work towards a, a marriage date, you know, but also it's providing tools and discussion opportunities that you can then use as in your toolbox as a couple throughout throughout your relationship. It's setting a good foundation mm -hmm. of of uh, communication, of transparency and openness. You know, to strengthen that. I think uh, it also connects with uh, what we talked about before: the mind. Mm -hmm. You know, often a relationship you think is just governed by your heart, but you need to open your mind as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chief Apostle said that years ago, you have to engage mind and heart in a relationship, and important that you maybe engage the mind first and then come to the heart to make sure you're on the same path, that you see things the same way, particularly your your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's important that you you can see that the same way and, and come on the same path or a parallel path to go to the same future. Yeah. And if you don't sort of settle that ahead of time that causes a lot of trouble later on and that's why this program sort of exposes all of that and opens that all of it for discussion mm -hmm. and it's something that uh, we actually didn't create ourselves it's a christian program that we've partnered with right that has thousands of couples worldwide that have gone through this right. uh, pro program that's very biblically and, and even um, psychologically based socially based you know in, in research exactly. and whatnot so exactly okay 
Fantastic. Well, we have, do you have time for one more question? Sure. We have one more. Sure, okay, down to the of end of it, Going back to a, a biblical question. What is to be learned from John uh, 6, 70? And I think it would probably be helpful just to read that. I'll read that quickly uh, for us just so we know what we're okay. talking about here. In John chapter 6, actually starting with verse uh, 68, uh, it says, But Simon Peter answered him, saying, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now this verse here, verse 70. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Uh, so the question is, what does we learn from John 6, 70, specifically this part about Jesus in, in the same sentence saying, I, I chose you, the twelve, but also Judas being a part of that, calling one of you as a devil. Why did Jesus choose Judas if he would betray Jesus? Mm -hmm. I think uh, the bigger question is, why did he choose me? Why did he choose you? He would have all to be saved. He loves all. And he loved Judas the same as he loved Peter. He, he chose them. And uh, they all had the opportunity to come close to Christ, to follow Christ, to learn from him. Um, Jesus, because he is God, knew ahead of time that he would be a betrayer of him. But uh, nevertheless, he loved him still and, and wanted him to be part of, uh, part of him. I, I don't know, I can't say that uh, with certainty, whether or not it had to be Judas to be a betrayer. But nevertheless, somebody had to betray God, because, or Jesus Christ, because it was prophesied that that's how it would happen. And also gave Jesus, could say to us, now I know what it's like to be betrayed by my friend. Mm -hmm. So all of those things all fit into it. Um, um, that, that Christ has that experience. Uh, but uh, again, we see also with Judas, I mean, we paint him very negatively, uh, but we see that he did repent. I and mean, he recognized he had done the wrong thing, uh, that he had seen things the wrong way. And so, you know, he also lays into the grace of God in some sense, you know. Hmm. Would, would that be considered a sin then? Like, was it, <laughs> what Judas did, was that a sin? If he had to repent for it, well, I think if if any time we we turn away from Christ or turn away from God, it is a sin. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it is. Uh, but again, we see that he did repent, yeah. uh, and the rest of the story we don't know how God deals with that or what. But I, just from what we imagine, the limitless love of God and Jesus Christ, I. I would imagine that somehow he can find grace, but yeah. um, again, he 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 just was misled uh, by his own, and he made the d decisions in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. But we can't really ask this question because he chooses all of us, and at one time or the other, we also betray Jesus Christ. We also turn against him. We also mm -hmm. uh, say, do, think things that are negative to him, and thank the Lord he's chosen us and that he loves us and is willing to forgive us. Mm -hmm. And accepts us and is patient with us and wants us to do better. Exactly. All the time. Yeah. And it's important that we realize he never expects us to be sinless. Mm -hmm. He expects us to love him and to grow up in him. That's what he expects. Mm -hmm. um, he knows that we will sin. It's inevitable. We, we can't. But he wants us to fight it. We promise that on our... Uh, confirmation vow. I renounce the devil. And, and we have to keep that fight, keep that pressure against evil while we grow in the mind of Christ. And that's what he's looking for us to do. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. No, thank you for bringing clarity to these questions here. And uh, thank you for joining us uh, on this Young Adult Virtual Q&A. First time we've tried something like this, thank you to those that submitted questions. Uh, for similar type of discussions, you can also check out For Your Journey. We have 80-something episodes that we've done mm -hmm. uh, over the years there, which are just some table talks and some more concise questions. The new season of that coming available and shortly here, uh, available on our NAC USA mobile app, as well as on YouTube and on Facebook. And as the District Postal mentioned, some of the answers from today's uh, questions can also be found in various articles from NAC Today and Community. The Community is the quarterly uh, magazine that gets mailed out uh, to members' homes as well as it's available online. 
and NAC Today is the international church's magazine, new, news magazine online that has individual articles every day except Sunday. So some of these can be explored there as well. And we thank you for, for joining us and encourage you to look at some of those resources. So Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. It was my pleasure, and I look forward to um, being together with the young adults again at, uh, on a weekend sometime when we can schedule that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you.